Uh, hey everybody, sorry, a little winded. I just dragged a lot of heavy, fairly heavy astrophotography gear up a fairly steep and fairly big sand dune. So I'm up here this weekend to do some camping. And while I'm here, I'm hoping to take advantage of some Bortle 4 skies. And what I'm hoping to see is some of the dark cloud surrounding the Iris Nebula. You see, the Iris Nebula is a reflection nebula, which means there is surrounding gas that isn't glowing because it's ionized, but rather it's reflecting the light off a star. But the further you get away from that reflection of that bright star, the more you get these dark bands of dust clouds that are just scattered throughout the area, and they look really, really cool. And I'm hoping at 300 millimeters, I'll be able to catch some of those. So join me tonight for some astrophotography fun. Hi, my name is Chris, and welcome to my channel. Let's take a step back for a minute. What exactly are those dark dust clouds, and how does the iris fit in? Imagine the Milky Way as a massive spinning disk, a vast swirl of stars, gas, and dust, all orbiting the galactic center. Most of that material stays close to the galactic plane, but some of it drifts far above and below, hundreds of light years off the main plane, forming these faint, ghostly clouds called Integrated Flux Nebulae, or IFN for short. IFN are like the cirrus clouds of our galaxy wispy delicate filaments of cold dust and gas that hang high above the bustling galactic midplane. Most IFN in our region, like the Polaris Flare, float around 300 to 500 light years away, well above the core traffic of stars and nebulae. Now here's the cool part, the Iris Nebula actually sits almost three times farther than the typical IFN, about 1,300 light years from us. It's embedded in a larger, dark molecular cloud complex called LDN-1172, a denser pocket of gas and dust where new stars can form. So when you image the iris, you're actually seeing a bright reflection nebula lit by a young hot binary star, HD200775, but you're also peering through to the even fainter IFN that extends around it and in the foreground. The result is this layered effect, the brilliant blue of the iris wrapped in a ghostly veil of diffuse interstellar cirrus clouds. To me, this is what makes IFN so fascinating. It's like looking out a window from our solar system toward the edge of the galactic neighborhood, catching a glimpse of the galaxy's high altitude clouds drifting far above the main disk. It's subtle, it's challenging, and I think it will absolutely be worth the effort to try to image. I am at the Pinary Provincial Park. This is a uh, great provincial park in uh, southern Ontario, known as a Oak Savannah. Funny story about this park. People decided to try to reclaim it uh, as a forested area, as a conservation area. And so they planted a lot of pines, not realizing that this wasn't originally uh, a pine forest. So the name Pinery stuck, even though this is in fact a forest known for oak. The threat is high. That's the threat of small animals. Uh, really? There's not nearly enough contrast in suburban skies, even with the best of filters, to pick out even the most reflective bits of IFN, whose surface brightness hovers around the same point as that of a decent dark sky of Bortle 4 or less. I picked IFN to image at the Pinary because it is already a Bortle 4 in general, and because I was hoping to image towards the direction of Lake Huron which would give me an even better chance at capturing the faint dust clouds. Though the spot I picked to image from was on a well-traveled path, I figured nobody would be walking through here at night. It was in a depression between sand dunes on the way to the beach, an elevated bowl of sand ridged by short pines and shrubs along the crest, where the land fell away giving the impression of being completely secluded 
with the dome of the sky gliding overhead, or the surreal feeling of floating in space on a tiny ball of sandy rock. But it seemed that the weather had other plans, and the dark clouds rolled in unexpectedly. I eventually caught a nap in the car, only to wake around 3 a.m. to find the clouds receding and a clear dark sky overhead. I quickly polar aligned my telescope and got to imaging. I'm using what I call my Frankenstein rig, which is a combination of gear not designed to go together. It has a mount from a Celestron SLT, running on a wedge fashioned out of a Vixen dovetail. The tripod is from an Astromaster AZ. A vintage Nikkor 300mm ED Prime lens serves as the telescope. I'm using an ASI 294MC Pro camera and a filter tray. The setup also sports a Svibani guide scope and guide camera, and the DSLR dew heater, all controlled through an old Windows 10 Lenovo IdeaPad 320. Using a direct ASCOM Celestron telescope driver, PhD2, and astrophotography tool, I quickly did a rough polar alignment using the reverse mounted red dot finder, my stand-in for a polar scope, and hoped for the best. I focused using a Batinov mask and started my imaging plan. It wouldn't be long before the sky started to brighten. There was some humidity in the air and the temperature was single digit Celsius. To keep the dew at bay, I strapped hand warmers to all of my lenses, including the eyepiece on a visual telescope I brought as well. I spent the time I had going back and forth between checking my imaging plan and guiding and looking at various cool objects through the 4 inch 660mm Acromat. The glow of the rising sun appeared in the eastern sky far too soon. I had gathered less than an hour of data, but I would not be disappointed for long, because to my surprise, rising ahead of the sun was the planet Venus, the morning star, and chasing it was a slim crescent moon. I quickly panned my Nikon around to capture as they rose together in the early dawn, followed some time later by a spectacular sunrise. This was definitely worth staying up for. I even made my way down to the beach to see the view from the lake. Here is the result of just 30 minutes of integration time on the iris. I imaged at 300 millimeters. You can see the reflection nebula as well as the glow from the ghost nebula nearby. You can also just start to make out bands of dust which can be easily mistaken for the optics and sensor playing tricks. Even though the image wasn't what I had hoped for, I still had a great time. In fact, the only downside was that everything was covered in sand. I don't like sand. It was coarse and got into everything. We came up again the following weekend with fingers crossed that conditions would be better. I had such a great experience with the sunrise that I wanted to capture the sunset as well, and so I set up on a rise above the beach and began imaging using a 14 millimeter lens and intervalometer with my DSLR. Everything started out well, but there they were. Again, my old nemesis, clouds. I was robbed of my sunset, but would they keep away long enough for me to have another shot at imaging the integrated flux nebula surrounding the iris? Yes, they would. This time, my son was there to give me a hand. Between the both of us, we made short work of dragging all the equipment up the hill, along with a couple of reclining beach chairs. I got to work on setting up the same imaging rig, while he manned the visual scope. It was really nice chilling in the reclining chairs and watching the dome of the sky wheel overhead. Unfortunately, the wind had picked up and we had gusts up over 30 kilometers per hour. Setting up in the depression closer to the line of small pines helped, but two-thirds of my frames had to be tossed, leaving me with an additional hour of data. Much better transparency made up a little for the lack of integration time, but I feel that the really good image I was looking for would elude me. Here's my final image after processing in Graxpert, Cyril, and Gimp. 
you can clearly make out the reflective dust regions which are visually surrounding the iris, which itself is embedded in a darker cloud of cosmic dust. And off to the left, the ghost nebula is also better defined than in my initial 30-minute capture. I'll be at a star party later this summer and may revisit this region, although I am tempted to move on as there is so much more out there to see. It's been many weeks since we came back from the Pinary, and I'm driving north to drop my son off at camp. The camp my son is going to happens to be a few kilometers away from a dark sky preserve called Torrance Barrens. So I decided to stay overnight and have another shot at capturing an integrated flux nebula. This is a dark sky preserve that I haven't visited in a couple of years, but it is a Bordel 4 location. This time I'm going to be aiming for the region around Polaris. Now in order to capture the area around Polaris, also known as the Polaris Flare, I'm going to be using a new camera. This is the ASI 2600 MC Pro. I'm very grateful to my wife and children for this awesome gift and a contribution to my delinquency. Located two hours north of Toronto, near the town of Gravenhurst, Torns Barrens became the world's first permanently designated dark sky preserve in 1999. Over the years, it has gone from a Bortle 2 to 3 to, I would say, around a 4, with the light dome from Gravenhurst brightening up the southern sky. The preserve itself is nearly 20 square kilometers of exposed Canadian shield bedrock, wetlands, and sparse trees, perfect for unobstructed horizons. It is known for its peaceful, rugged landscape. You often see rocky outcrops, shallow lakes, and stunted pines, and a variety of wildlife. There was a large beaver enjoying a small pond down the slope from where I was set up. The place has become quite popular with visitors from Toronto who come up to hike, watch the sunset, or simply enjoy the stars. Unfortunately, not everyone is aware of dark sky etiquette, so you have to be careful not to get beamed in the eyes with a powerful flashlight. It can also get quite crowded in some areas. I learned my lesson from my last visit and planned accordingly, setting up on a ridge of a north-facing, sloping hill of a rock where people were less likely to camp. I ended up with an unobstructed view of Polaris all night. I brought out my Celestron Nexstar 6SE to use as a visual scope, which I used to run through a sky tour in the early hours, while my imaging rig ran through its imaging capture sequence. The visual scope was also popular with curious stargazers, and I was happy to do a little outreach. My rig for tonight consisted of the same Celestron SLT mount and Astromaster AZ tripod as I had used at the Pinary. But instead of the 300mm Nikkor, I brought a 135mm f2 Rokinon lens along with my new ASI 2600 MC Pro camera. This setup would give me a much wider field of view with faster optics. My initial polar alignment was a breeze, and guiding seemed pretty good until I slewed to Polaris. Guiding at Polaris seemed impossible. The mount could not keep up with guide commands, even when I set them very aggressively. I had to use my powers of deduction to move the tripod right ascension and declination based on which way the guide graph was sloping, until I eventually zeroed in on the right position. And once I did, guiding was extremely good at least for this mount. Until that is, it came time to dither, and then whoo-wee, did dithering go off. The sky was perfect overnight with no wind or cloud cover. I had to run the dew heater as the temperature fell below the dew point. I was worried this might drain my batteries faster, but with almost everything running on the 12 volt port, the batteries held up until just before 4 a.m. when the sky started to brighten. At that point, I packed up and made the three-hour drive home. Here's the image I was able to capture. You can see Polaris, center top, and open cluster NGC 188 to the left. 
the integrated flux nebula surrounding Polaris stretches down and to the left, with scattered nebulosity throughout. IFN in general seem to have a translucent, beige collar, setting them apart from the vibrant collars you would find in emission, reflection, and planetary nebulae. There are many reasons to love integrated flux nebulas. For one, they have this eerie, ghostly beauty to them, which you don't get with too many other types of nebulas. They're also quite difficult to image, so if you want to push yourself and your optics to see what you can do, then these are a perfect challenge. And lastly, they combine some of the coolest aspects of astrophotography. They are spectacular. They require specialized equipment, and imaging them can be a real adventure. I had to take three trips to remote locations to find a dark enough sky to be able to capture them. So if you haven't already, I strongly urge you to try to capture an integrated flux nebula. You won't be disappointed unless you don't catch anything, and then you will be disappointed. So uh, remember, it's the journey, not the destination. Till next time, thanks for watching, and clear skies.